God, you are great and good and true. Thank you for revealing yourself to us in the, the various ways that you have. Uh, you have found it right to disclose yourself to unworthy creatures. And uh, God, that is only for our benefit, only for our blessing to know our maker uh, and then to draw near to us as not only our creator, but savior as well. Uh, we are so thankful and owe you all praise and glory and honor that is due you. This morning, as we uh, turn our attention to your word, I pray that you would remove me out of the way and just make your word clear, make your truth clear, help me to uh, articulate the way I ought to so that you are seen for who you are and that your people are encouraged uh, to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Uh, if you would use us to that end, uh, regardless of what comfort comes or discomfort uh, comes with being used to that one great end, we would uh, be eternally grateful. And so we pray you would accomplish your will in us this morning. In Christ's name, amen. All right. This morning, uh, we're going to wrap up the, the first round of this Equipping Hour series. So this will be part six of this, uh, really what's been an introduction uh, into the subject. And uh, if you would, take your Bibles and go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. This is where we began this series. Does my daughter have my water bottle? I'm going to need that. <laughs> Thanks, Acadia. So we, we begin in, in 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, looking at verses 17 and 18 in particular. Thank you. And I want to just reread that and then uh, highlight what we'll be uh, hearing today. 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. This passage uh, describes really succinctly in a helpful way what is sanctification. Uh, again, the, the word doesn't appear in this passage, but what's being described here is an incremental transformation happening to the believer accomplished by God's spirit as he changes that believer into the same image uh, the very image of God, who is Christ. Particular to our focus this morning is the phrase in the middle of 18, beholding, dot, 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 the glory of the Lord. And this is as in a mirror. So not a perfect reflection, uh, something of a dim glimpse of the glory of the Lord. But this is our task uh, in sanctification. One of the things that we must be about, one of the things that we must be doing is beholding the glory of the Lord. And it is, as this verse states, particularly as that happens or by that means that the transformation occurs. God is eager to sanctify his people as they fixate and focus on his glory, is the point. 
Beholding God's glory is transformative. Beholding the glory of God is transformative. And so this morning, what we want to uh, unpack really is that very concept of beholding the glory of God. What does Paul have in view and the other biblical writers when they discuss the glory of God? God's glory, that word, uh, Old and New Testament, have to do with weight. Simple, it's weight. What is weighty or impressive Whatever it is about God that uh, produces in the minds of, of others that would cause them to esteem him worthy of honor, uh, that is, in summation, what his glory is. Those impressive, weighty characteristics of God that garner the reverence and fear and appreciation and marveling at his very character. And so everything about God obviously fits into that category. Every, there is nothing about God that is not weighty, that is not impressive, that is not stunning, that does not or should not garner amazement uh, from us. And so as we talk about and think about beholding the glory of God, uh, what is great or what is impressive about God, I want us to consider the very practice of beholding the glory of God requires us to see God in a certain light. And for starters, it requires us to know that God is great. If we would rightly behold the glory of God, if we would practice beholding the glory of God, we must know as a baseline principle, God himself is very great. Flip over to Psalm 145, because our outline for this morning sort of follows this pattern laid out or just described in Psalm 145. A psalm of praise of David. I will extol you, my God and O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. There's extolling happening. There's an acknowledgement of a personal relationship with God. There's an acknowledgement of God's kingship. There is the practice of blessing God's very name. Always in verse one, he continues every day. I will bless you. I will praise your name forever and ever. And then this statement, great is Yahweh. Great is Yahweh and greatly to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable. Here in verse three, David writes acknowledging what is true about God, that God is great. And at the end of verse three, He tells us what kind of greatness God possesses. It is greatness that cannot be fully fathomed. Unsearchable greatness is what God possesses. Not just a little bit of greatness, not just earthly greatness, not just temporal greatness, not greatness with limitations, but greatness that can't ever truly be searched out. The person who embarks on a search to discover just how great God is will never see the end of that search is the point. 
Therefore, he is, ought to be, praised greatly. God ought to be praised in keeping, in a way that is in keeping with his own inherent greatness. Uh, I appreciate the ESV's translation. If you're looking at the NASB, it says highly to be praised. The repetition is helpful when it gets translated greatly to be praised. So great is Yahweh and greatly to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable. Just as a baseline, we must be convinced if we would rightly behold the glory of God that is going to transform us more and more into Christ's image, we must be convinced that God is great. He is great in his nature and in his works. His nature, his works, they bear witness to his greatness. Uh, in his own nature, God possesses this greatness that was not bestowed on him. It wasn't given to him. He didn't come to possess this unsearchable greatness in increments or with the passing of time. He has never grown in his greatness. He has always and forever from eternity past on into eternity future. He will be as great as he has ever been. He has been unchanging and immutable in his greatness. And you have passages that just tell us uh, these things. Go to Second Peter. These uh, two doxologies that capture this very truth of the greatness that is inherent in God's own nature. Second Peter chapter three, verse 18. As Peter wraps up a discussion warning his audience about being, being aware, being wary of false teachers, he tells them positively, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God doesn't change. We do. We grow. We must grow in this grace and knowledge of Christ. And then he finishes the entire epistle with these words to him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Glory belongs to God currently until forever. God possesses eternal greatness. That is his nature in Jude. Jude ends with a similar note, his epistle, verse 25, says, To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be, belong, glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. The glory, majesty, dominion, and authority that belong to God have always belonged to God, will always belong to God, and belong to God currently as we are sitting here. So God's own greatness uh, belongs to him by right. It's eternal. It's inherent. He possesses this greatness uh, instantaneously in a, in a moment every moment and exhaustively. There's nothing about God that is not great. If you can think of something true about God, then it is great. That thing you are thinking about that God possesses in his own character is great, weighty. And this can be seen not only in his nature, but in his very works. His works get descriptions, adjectives attached to them, commensurate with the greatness that God himself possesses in his own nature. Look at Psalm 111 for an example of this.
Verse 1, Psalm 111, praise Yahweh. I will give thanks to Yahweh with all my heart in the company of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of Yahweh. They are studied by all who delight in them. Splendid and majestic is his work and his righteousness endures forever. He has made his wonders to be remembered. Yahweh is gracious and compassionate. So the very works of God themselves being great prove the point that God himself possesses inherent greatness. Some of the works that we see in which we see the greatness of God include creation. Creation itself, as you read through those simple but elegant chapters in Genesis and the first chapters in your Bible, demonstrate the greatness of God that by mere speaking, he can call things that do not exist into existence. You've never done that. I've never done that. No person alive can do that, regardless of what some people might tell you. We don't create something out of nothing. You can't make matter. You can't have, you can't even think a thought of something that doesn't exist. You know, you can't imagine, if you will, something that doesn't already, there's not already a pattern or an image of it. You can take things that God has already created and combine them into something that may not exist, but you can't have a brand new imagination, something that's never existed that God doesn't, hasn't already laid the foundation for uh, in creation. That proves the greatness of his creativity in creation. Uh, And even the the ongoing uh, things that happen in creation prove God's own greatness. Uh, Job is a great book to see this. Job 37. Just listen to the description of one young wise counselor who's fixated on the glory of God and God's own greatness. And he's trying to help his wayward friend fixate on those same truths. As he wraps up his counsel, Elihu, Job 37, verse 1 says, At this also my heart trembles and leaps out of its place. Keep listening to the thunder of his voice and the rumbling that comes from his mouth. Under the whole heaven he lets it go, and his lightning to the corners of the earth. After it his voice roars, he thunders with his majestic voice, and he does not restrain the lightnings when his voice is heard. God thunders wondrously with his voice. He does great things that we cannot comprehend. He's not saying that because he's uh, an ancient, primitive figure. The things he goes on to describe, we still haven't figured out. For to the snow, he says, fall on the earth. Likewise to the downpour, his mighty downpour. He seals up the hand of every man that all men whom he made may know it. Then the beasts go into their lairs and remain in their dens. From its chamber comes the whirlwind and cold from the scattering winds. By the breath of God, ice is given and the broad waters are frozen fast. He loads the thick clouds with moisture, the clouds scattering his lightning. They turn around and around by his guidance to accomplish all that he commands them on the face of the habitable world, whether for correction or for his land or for love, he causes it to happen. Hear this, O Job, stop and consider the wondrous works of God. Do you know how God lays his command upon them and causes the lightning of his cloud to shine? Do you know the balancing of of the clouds, the wondrous works of him who is perfect in knowledge, you whose garments are hot when the earth is still because of the south wind, can you like him spread out the skies 
hard as a cast metal iron, metal mirror? Teach us that we would teach us what we shall say to him. We cannot draw up our case because of darkness. Shall it be told him that I would speak? Did a man ever wish that he would be swallowed up? God picks up right where Elihu ends up leading off and continues the questions that Job has no answers to by describing God's greatness as it's manifested in creation, just really pulling back the curtain on the wisdom and splendor and knowledge and power of God so that Job is sufficiently humbled We can see God's greatness even currently in creation. Some other works, just to name a few. The Exodus is another wondrous work of God. Judgment. Each time God judges, these also are wondrous works of God revealing the greatness of various aspects of his character. Think about the fall, the greatness of God's holiness revealed in the departure of Adam and Eve from the garden forever because of one sin. God's holiness is pristine. He will not compromise it to maintain fellowship with man. God is great in holiness. He has the power to curse the entire earth and throws the entire universe into ruin because of man. God did that. God is great in power. He curses man, demonstrating the greatness of his justice. Uh, He also blesses man uh, and leaves hope for man, promising a savior in that same section, one who would come and destroy the serpent who was the first tempter, the murderer from the beginning, demonstrating the greatness of his grace and faithfulness. Now, even in God's judgment, the the greatness of God is revealed, the greatness of God uh, in the flood, that he would destroy the entire world, uh, punish Animals get caught up in his judgment because of his wrath against man and reduce the entire population down to eight. Demonstrating his own self-sufficiency. He can do without man. He can do with or without man. The greatness of God's self-sufficiency is on display in that. Sodom and Gomorrah the greatness of God's righteousness to destroy evildoers in an instant and yet spare the righteous. Even in that passage, uh, the Lord being merciful toward Lot removed him from the city, forced him to leave because it was a demonstration of God's mercy that he would not cause the righteous to be caught up with the wicked in the judgment. And even the, right, the white throne judgment in Revelation 20, another judgment, another great work of God, still outstanding. John writes in Revelation 20, verse 11, then I saw a great white throne. The throne itself is marked by God's greatness. The throne is great. And him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. There is nowhere to go where God is not. The greatness of God's presence. John continues, verse 12, And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, And books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written 
in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them according to their deeds. What great attributes must God possess to do that very thing, to judge each one according to their deeds? We don't have that ability. You could, you, we can't judge ourselves according to our deeds. We would err on having all the data necessary. We would err in rightly discerning the motives because we lack wisdom. We would err in our own memory to remember all of the deeds done. We would err in our ability to exact the right amount of punishment for the crime. We are not great in knowledge. We are not great in wisdom. We are not great in justice. We are not great in righteousness. We are not great in our own holiness. God is those things. This makes him the only and best judge of all the earth. Even the power exerted to resurrect the dead. We don't have that ability either. We are not great in power. God is. God's greatness is demonstrated even in his works of judgment and as well as salvation. Ephesians 2 describes God's greatness as it comes to salvation. Nothing great about the way we used to be, verses 1 through 3 in Ephesians chapter 2. But God, being not just merciful, right, don't, don't miss the adjectives being uh, attached to these words. But God being rich in mercy, rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved and raised up, uh, raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that purpose in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. He is gracious. He is rich in grace and intends to show the surpassing nature of those very riches of his grace. You know, Paul is just laboring to stack high the descriptions of how great God must be as it is demonstrated in his salvation of us. The, the reason scriptures describing God in these ways, you know, as you think about when you wake up sleepy eyed in the morning, you're reading your Bible and you can just so easily, we can miss the significance of what the author's aiming at and heaping up description upon description to get us to get a glimpse of God's glory in a moment. We need the scriptures, obviously, to have that clarity. But all of this is intending to exalt God high so that when we think about God, an adequate, somewhat adequate representation of him comes to mind. We don't serve a little God. We serve a great God, and we must think of him in that way. As we do that, that's sanctifying to think of God in those terms, to widen the gap in your own mind between who God is and who we are. That is good. That is right. 
so that when you think about disobedience, when you're tempted to disobey in a moment, what comes to mind is this kind of God. How could I sin against so good a God? Uh, Sin should lose its savor to us because of who we know God to be. And that takes work to, to meditate on those thoughts. Uh, not just in the moment of temptation. Uh, in, in that moment, the temptation's on upon you and you're in the moment. To saturate your heart in these truths all the time is the best way to be prepared for when temptation comes. John Owen, uh, I've got a quote up for you on the screen. He connects this greatness of God with progress and holiness in this way. This is uh, chapter 12 of the mortification of sin, which the entire chapter is about this very principle, how the greatness of God and meditating on the greatness and glory of God sanctifies the believer, helps him to put sin to death. He says, Be much in thoughtfulness of the excellency of the majesty of God and thine infinite inconceivable distance from him. Many thoughts of it cannot but fill thee with a sense of thine own vileness, which strikes deep at the root of any indwelling sin. Be much in thoughts of this nature to abase the pride of thy heart and to keep thy soul humble within thee. There is nothing will create in thee a great indisposition to be imposed on by the deceits of sin than such a frame of heart. Think greatly of the greatness of God. As we purpose to know that God is great, we must also know that God's greatness is incomprehensible. As you work with the scriptures open, reasoning with the words that God has given us, that he has spoken to us and preserved for us in his word, you must not only know that God is great, but you must know the kind of greatness that God possesses, which is incomprehensible, or to put it in the language of the psalmist, unsearchable greatness. We must think of God's greatness this way. We obviously already read it. It's stated that God is incomprehensible in his greatness. The quality of his greatness cannot be fully fathomed. That is explicitly stated in scripture in a passage like Psalm 145 verse three, but it's also stated in other ways in other places in scripture, going back to Job verse 20, uh, chapter 26. Starting at verse six, Job says some things that are true in a foolish rant, what ends up being poorly spoken. He does articulate some astonishing truths about God, like chapter 26, verse six, Sheol is naked before God and Abaddon has no covering. He stretches out the north over the void and hangs the earth on nothing. He binds up the waters in his thick clouds and the cloud is not split open under them. That is still inconceivable. That water, which is heavier than the cloud, gets trapped in the cloud and carried over dry land so that it would rain in drops, not dumped on dry land in a way that doesn't crush the vegetation, but nourishes it, produces crop for the farmer and all of that from vast oceans strips the salt from the water and then drops it fresh on the, on the land. 
I have no idea how that happens. Neither do you. God does it. Verse 9 says, He also covers the face of the full moon and spreads over it his cloud. He has inscribed a circle on the face of the waters at the boundary between light and darkness. The pillars of heaven tremble and are astounded at his rebuke. If the pillars of heaven tremble and are astounded at his rebuke, then how much more should we tremble and be astounded at his rebuke? By his power, he stilled the sea. By his understanding, he shattered Rahab. By his wind, the heavens were made fair. His hand pierced the fleeing serpent. Lo and behold, all of these things that were just described are but the outskirts of his ways. And how small a whisper do we hear of him. But the thunder of his power who can understand all of the unfathomable things that God does that we behold, we would be foolish to think that God in all of his great majesty and might is showing us everything that's there when he unveils his greatness in creation. Those things, when, you, when we behold, even in the ways described, these astonishing feats of nature, when those things take place, they tell us more about what we're not witnessing than what we are. The power and understanding and, and knowledge that must be present in God to manifest a glimpse in these ways, we have no idea. These are the outskirts of his ways, the fringes of his ways. He is capable of so much more. That's just regarding God's power and understanding. The greatness of his self-sufficiency is described in Job 35. God does not need man. God does not need any created thing. Verse 6 says, If you have sinned, speaking to Job, what do you accomplish against him? And if your transgressions are multiplied... What do you do to him? Sin doesn't hurt God. He's not affected ultimately by sinners sinning against him. As if when a sinner shakes his fist against God, God's harmed in some way by that. Psalm 2 says he sits in the heavens and does what? Laughs when all the nations gather against him. That's the case. When a man sins against God, that's no threat to him. Likewise, obedience, it works the same way. Verse 7, if you are righteous, what do you give to him? Or what does he receive from your hand? Even our obedience does nothing ultimately for God. The best that we can do in obeying God is to merely be a finger pointing to the greatness that exists in him to say, see, this is what God is like. This is who God is to demonstrate his kingship, his lordship, his authority, his kindness. When we obey, we can respond to God and be a demonstration that those things are true. We can exhibit those things in our own conduct to reflect the kindness of God, the patience of God in a moment. But we don't add anything to God. We don't take anything from God. We don't even give him some degree of greatness or glory that he doesn't already possess. We don't give him honor that he doesn't already have, isn't already worthy of. We can't honor him more than he already is honored. And so the best that we can do 
which is only appropriate, is to help pull back the veil, if you will, for ourselves, for others. This is what God is like. Chapter 36 in Job, verse 26, gives commentary on the greatness of God's uh, years, how unsearchable his years are. Behold, God is great, and we know him not. The number of his years is unsearchable. God's greatness is unsearchable. So is the greatness of his age, his years. He existed before time. Consider the, how the scriptures state that God's greatness is incomprehensible regarding his own sovereignty. I mean, how long and how many times has this perplexed men that God could be as sovereign as the scriptures describe him and yet remain perfectly pure and upright, never sinning, never violating justice or what is true righteousness, that baffles us. At the end of Job 37, verse 23, states the incomprehensibility of God's own justice. The Almighty, we cannot find him. He is great in power, justice and abundant righteousness. He will not violate that's right. Justice and abundant righteousness, he will not violate because everything he does, he is only capable of doing what is just. It does not exist in his nature to do anything else. And so his sovereignty, just to describe for you what I mean about the incomprehensibility of, of this very attribute, God can intend evil without sinning. God can intend evil without sinning. That's patently biblical. Genesis 50, verse 20. Many of you know this verse well. It's also easily misquoted because it says, as for you, Joseph, speaking to his brothers, you meant, intended, desired evil against me. But God meant, intended, willed evil, it, but for a different purpose, for good, in order to bring it about this present result to preserve many people alive. Does God mean evil? Well, only in the way that Genesis 50, 20 means he, meant, he means evil. Joseph's brothers meant evil. God meant it, evil, but not for evil's sake, for good. How that all works out, how he can be sovereign and intend evil without evil intentions, I have no idea. I've never, I've never done that. I've never intended evil without evil intentions. God decrees, not only intends evil, but God decrees sin without sinning. Lamentations 3 describes this as Jeremiah observed the horror of what happened in the destruction of Jerusalem. Um, and you could read the curses in Jeremiah 19 of what that was like to watch the siege and what was the kinds of evil that was happening. You can read Deuteronomy 28 because that's the, the prophetic word about what would happen. Things like, women eating their children. You wouldn't want to see that in your worst nightmares. And yet, Jeremiah says, 
verse 37, Lamentations 3, who is there who speaks and it comes to pass unless the Lord has commanded it, unless he's decreed that it would take place. You say you're going to do some stuff. If that is actually what happens, it's only because God said you were going to do that same stuff. Who is there who speaks and it comes to pass unless the Lord has commanded it? Is it not, verse 38, from the mouth of the Most High that both good and ill go forth? Yes, it is from the mouth of the Most High that both of those things happen, good and ill. Whatever fits into the category of good, God decreed. Whatever fits into the category of evil, God decreed. Lastly, regarding God's sovereignty, he not only intends evil without sinning and not only decrees evil without sinning, he fulfills sinful events again without sinning. God fulfills sinful events without sinning. Acts chapter 3 says this very thing. Peter talking again to the Jews says this in verse 12, men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Or why do you gaze at us as if by our own power or piety, we made him walk the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers has glorified his servant, Jesus. This is the one whom you delivered and disowned in the presence of Pilate. That was sinful to deliver over and disown Jesus to Pontius Pilate, even when Pilate, verse 13, had decided to release him. Verse 14, but you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, but put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. And on the basis of faith in his name, It is the name of Jesus, which has strengthened this man whom you see and know. And the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all. It's his explanation. But look at what he says. Verse 17. Now, brethren, I know that you acted in ignorance. That's not a good thing. Just as your rulers did also. But the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets. That's what he's just finished describing. The resurrection, the suffering, the delivering over and everything in between the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer. He God has thus fulfilled. There was sin involved. There were Good, beneficial things happening. God said it would happen beforehand. He fulfilled it. How does he do that in his sovereignty without sinning? Scripture says both happen. And so on faith, we take God at his word. Our job isn't to figure out how that's possible But in the very fact that we can't figure it out is an opportunity to marvel at the glory of God and let that stretch your mind and expand your heart and generate worshipful affection and love for a God who is so beyond your ability to comprehend. That is sanctifying. If you embrace that view of God, you think the next time something evil happens to you, you will not trust him. The worst evil he was sovereign over. I can trust him with things that happen to me. The same things about the incomprehensibility of God's greatness are true of Everything we've mentioned, uh, you could expand this list to include his knowledge, justice, righteousness, grace, mercy, patience, 
we don't have categories for the level, the quality of God's greatness that exists in, his, in, in these attributes. And this is demonstrated well, proven well by the gospel itself. No, no better place to see these attributes and how limited we are to really grapple with them than to look at the cross where those things are put on display like nowhere else. This quote was too long to put up for you on the, on the screen, but I'm going to read it. Just listen to how Stephen Charnock in his uh, existence and attributes of God describes this incomprehensibility of God. Every man is to have a conception of God. Therefore, he ought to have one of the highest elevation. Since we cannot have a full notion of him, we should endeavor to make it as high and as pure as we can. All the perfections of God are infinitely elevated above the excellencies of the creatures above whatsoever can be conceived by the clearest and most piercing understanding. Whatsoever God is, he is infinitely so. He is infinite wisdom, infinite goodness, infinite knowledge, infinite power, infinite spirit, infinitely distant from the weakness of creatures, infinitely mounted above the excellencies of creatures. As easy to be known that he is, as impossible to be comprehended what he is. Conceive of him as excellent without any imperfection, a spirit without parts, great without quantity, perfect without quality, everywhere without place, powerful without members, understanding without ignorance, wise without reasoning, light without darkness, infinitely more excelling the beauty of all creatures than the light in the sun, pure and unviolated, exceeds the splendor of the sun, dispersed and divided through a cloudy and misty air. And when you have risen, when you have risen to the highest, conceive him yet infinitely above all you can conceive of spirit and acknowledge the infirmity of your own minds. And whatsoever conception comes into your minds, say, this is not God. God is more than this. If I could conceive him, he were not God, for God is incomprehensibly above whatever I can say, whatever I can think, whatever I can conceive of him. With that kind of view of God in our thoughts, resolved to think of it, resolved to think of him in those terms, really what, what is left for us to do is to respond appropriately. Respond appropriately, Christian. If you believe in that God, if you recognize that that God who is so far above and beyond us has saved you, condescended in the person of his son to rescue you and bring you into intimate fellowship with him so that you can display that very greatness that you can't conceive of fully in simple acts of obedience? Is it too much to ask? Is it, is it so unreasonable to say, don't be anxious? Don't be anxious. Control your vessel in holiness and honor. Be self-controlled. Keep yourself pure. Be holy as I am holy. Is that too much? Of course not. To have to recognize something of that God, that God is something like that, 
that he possesses some kind of greatness like that will do anything, right? It makes, with, with that view of God in mind, it makes every single act of obedience perfectly legitimate and reasonable and understandable. It makes us even, even knowing the greatness of his goodness, when, when he gives a command, I respond thinking, man, what a burden. These are the things I have to do. No, God is good. I can run after obedience because God is eager to bless. I believe him in that way. It's exactly the way he describes uh, his own wisdom communicated to us. When God gives commands, he does not give them to remove joy, but only to increase it. Listen to Proverbs 3.13 through 18. Blessed is the one who finds wisdom, not burden. Blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding. The one to whom God's wisdom, the one to whom God's understanding is a burden, is a fool. If you are burdened by obedience, you are foolish to be burdened by obedience. God is intending to increase joy and blessing and everlasting, unshakable happiness. And so blessed is the one who finds wisdom and who gets understanding because the gain from her is better than gain from silver and her profit better than gold. She is more precious than jewels and nothing you desire, nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand, in her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Those who hold her fast are called, again, blessed. And so Christian, because God is God, pursue sanctification. Pursue sanctification because God is great. And with that idea, with that thought in mind, let that saturate all of your pursuits of the holiness that God himself gives. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for revealing what we had no way of knowing apart from you telling us. If you would have been pleased to leave yourself in the dark, to not disclose your character to us, we would have had nothing to say. We would have no right protest to, to give. Even that would have been right. And yet you determined to do something else that was right, which is reveal yourself and even give us a standard for living that is our joy to keep. I pray that you would distract us with lofty thoughts of yourself, that you would make us eager to approach you, to think of you in these ways, and that because you are who you've revealed, that that would fuel all of our obedience so that we would have no boast, but as you have written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.